Welcome back. A big win for President Trump, but did he spike the ball at the 50-yard line? Yesterday, the House narrowly approved the repeal and replacement of Obamacare and a Republican plan to replace it. Republicans say Obamacare is in a death spiral. As polls show, more than half Americans want to keep it, however. The Congressional Budget Office estimated under the previous version of the bill, 24 million Americans would lose coverage. However, $8 billion has been added to help cover those with pre-existing conditions, but the coverage is not guaranteed. The new plan could also cut Medicaid for older Americans. Its future in the Senate, as we just saw, is unclear. Meanwhile, Congress is passing a temporary spending bill. And no, there is no money in that bill for the wall with Mexico. And this week, the FBI Director James Comey is testifying before Congress on why he felt compelled to announce he was reopening the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails just day, days before the election. Democrats are criticizing him for not disclosing the investigation into ties between the Trump campaign and Russia. And joining us for more on The Week in Washington is Patrick Montega, editor and publisher of La Gazette newspaper, Keith Fitzgerald, a professor of political science at New College of Florida. He is also a former Democratic member of the Florida House. And Frank Patty, the secretary of the Republican Party of Sarasota. And Frank, you used to work in the insurance industry, so you know right. a lot about health care. First, you know, when we uh, saw the story before, um, you know, they, they showed all the, uh, you know, Paul Ryan saying that you should not vote on the bill unless you know what's in it and how much it costs. And the Republicans passed this bill without a hearing, without a score from the Congressional Budget Office. How do you mesh those two things together? Well, basically, uh, the plan itself is going to be rewritten th uh, when it gets to the Senate. This plan, uh, like any plan, is only a draft, and in a sense a draft, because there's a lot of things missing out of it. In any, in any sense, rushing any health plan to get it out, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, is insane. So you, you're no, saying no this was a mistake? Would. Not a mistake. It's just that um, they got, they've got the ball rolling now, and let's see where it goes at this point. Uh, I'm sure they'll read it over. There was a push to get something through before, uh, you know, before the session ended. They didn't do badly in all of some cases. They have to add and change some things in there that there's no doubt about, and the Senate definitely will. Uh, for, uh, Keith, you served in the Florida legislature. Is this how you did things there? Uh, no, it's not how we did thing in, uh, things in the Florida legislature, although I wouldn't necessarily use that as a standard <laughs> for how you get things done. Uh, I did serve on three mm. different health care reform committees, and actually we worked on things uh, in a fairly meticulous fashion. and. I would also say a bipartisan fashion. This was a completely partisan uh, bill. There was no effort or outreach to include the Democrats. And I'm surprised to hear uh, someone say from the Republican side that it's insane to rush something through like this because this absolutely was rushed through. And all the reports uh, indicate that it was rushed through because the president was desperate for a win, not because anybody thought that this was probative or sane public policy. Patrick, you deal with so many parts of our community from so many different county, counties in our general area. Do you get a sense where people stand on this? Because you know we read our viewer comments, and you will find intense comments uh, against Obamacare, for Obamacare. What's the sense you get? Well, I think that you know what this is going to do, it's going to make a lot of people scared. You know, if you've got Obamacare, you're going to be scared that this isn't going to work for you. If you don't have Obamacare, or if you're, or if you're, you're, you're unsatisfied with Obamacare, you're not going to be necessarily sure this is going to make things better. Um, uh, this is a big unknown. What they did uh, in the House was uh, they, re they, they did the uh, uh, repeal. They really didn't do the replace. They just tossed this up and said, yeah, here's some paperwork, and, and, and this might replace it, but, but you know, we're going to uh, send it over to the Senate. They did the repeal, and that's what they're celebrating. They, they got that half of it done. They've, they've, they've killed Obamacare effectively, but they haven't come up with what they're going to be doing. Although I would add that they also have wrecked Medicaid. So in addition to doing the repeal, they did something further and beyond what was already on the table. And there are already a lot of Republican governors who are saying off the record that that may be uh, the most difficult part of this particular bill for them. Sure. I mean, we, we've definitely pulled more people out of pain in the system. Uh, we, we've taken off some of the safety. Uh, uh, the uh, fixing Obamacare we should have been doing over the past eight years, we haven't been able to because we've been too partisan. And this is starting off on the wrong foot. You, you, you I don't agree your head. with that. Uh, fixing Obamacare was impossible. The whole structure was wrong. Okay, there was no cost containment in the thing. 
Uh, there, there was no way to control the course. They had an open door, swinging door policy. Come in when you want. I'll give you a very fast example. You come in in October, you pay $2,000 worth of premiums. In December, you give me $15,000 worth of claims. I don't have that in my premiums for this year. I don't have that in my premiums for next year. I don't have that in my reserves, which is another thing you'll bump. Frank, let me, let me ask you this. Um, I'm going to give you a quote here. Mm -hmm. My constituents should not have to take a step back word in their ability to obtain treatment for any illness. That's coming from a member of Congress from Florida. That's mm -hmm. coming from a Republican member of Congress in yeah. Florida, Ileana Ross Layton from uh, the Miami area. We mentioned that Medicaid is being cut. The, the pre-existing conditions, whether they will, there's a guarantee that they will be covered, we don't know. So there are a lot of people who are watching this broadcast right now who fall into that category, especially in Sarasota where there are so many retirees. What do you say to them? The talk originally was that they would give grants before the Medicaid instead of the government handling that, but the states individually. I think that's probably the way it's going to go to beef up the Medicaid. It will cut down on the cost. They, they're looking at who's getting Medicaid number two. I think they have to look at the whole situation with Medicaid, what the cost is, and who's getting it. There, there's something like an eight billion dollar mm -hmm. pool for those who uh, have pre-existing conditions, right. but you know, traditionally Republicans hate unfunded mandates. So, in essentially, you're, you're pushing some of these uh, requirements back on the states, but not right. providing all the money to do that. First, first of all, states have tried high-risk pools in the in the past, and that's the scheme that they've come up here uh, with. Here, they don't work. And one of the reasons they don't work is states don't have the fiscal base that the uh, federal government has. And furthermore, people are reluctant to pay into a high-risk pool. They don't know exactly what it means. Uh, and $8 billion is not even in the ballpark close enough to pick up the cost that would come from doing that. So the high, it's just not a, not a very workable The high-risk right. pool that you're talking about is state. The high-risk pool we've been talking about is dropping the requirements across states, letting some right. of these companies merge and have a bigger pool. I get a sense we're offset. not done with this topic yet. Not at so all. Why not at we are all. just getting started. We'll pick up the discussion right after we check on weather. We'll be right back. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we are discussing the week in Washington from the House's vote to repeal Obamacare to the budget deal to the high-profile congressional hearings. Our guests tonight are Patrick Mantega of La Gazzetta Newspaper, Keith Fitzgerald of New College of Florida, and Frank Patty of the Republican Party of Sarasota. Let's continue for a moment on health care, the politics of it. People watching this, Nancy Pelosi, a lot of people dislike her intensely. A lot of people do like her. But she, when she made her floor speech uh, yesterday, I, I couldn't help but be taken by what she said. You will have every provision of this bill tattooed on your forehead. You will glow in the dark. She mentioned, and she's right, most people don't know the member, names of their members of Congress, even in, in this congressional district. But she's guaranteeing that you will now. Frank, is there any concern of the blowback um, that people in our area are going to have because once you give them uh, a certain entitlement, it's awfully hard to take it away? The thing basically is the plan's not done. It's going to the Senate, and they know there will be some vital changes throughout it. They wanted to get the ball rolling. They wanted to get something on the boards. They did that. Now it'll be going to the Senate. Then it'll come back again for reconciliation between the two. You're nowhere near done. You're in the first quarter. And so to say that is tattooed on your head. I hate to tell her. Obamacare is tattooed on her head. It's a collapsing plan in itself. Companies are pulling, the insurance companies are pulling out. Rates are doubling. The deductibles are doubling. I had a friend, well, she was all for it. Her son was getting, it was only a couple hundred bucks a month. Then she got hit with the reality the next year when it went up each year. And the deductibles did. Now she hates it. She says, I'm sorry, I voted for Obama. This is terrible. Patrick, in our area, is there any political peril for the members of Congress around here who voted uh, to repeal and replace? I think there is. Um, you know, it, it's no longer going to be Obamacare. It's going to be Trump care. And every Republican's going to carry this with them. And I can tell you, you know, their, their premise that they can do better for less money isn't going to work. It has not worked with health care. You've got to pay for health care, and that's all there is to it. And so uh, the likelihood of them coming up with some spectacular plan that somehow makes us have 
lower premiums, better coverage is not a reality. So, you know, when you look at a Bill Arrakis, when you look at a Vern Buchanan, you know, they could start to see their narrows margin, and once people start to smell blood in the water, you never know what's going to happen. But I figured um, whether or not members or local members of Congress would be concerned about their, their, their next campaign, the 2018 midterms, would be how they vote on this campaign, uh, on this bill. If, if they were concerned, they would not vote for it, but Vern Buchanan, Gus Filarakis, Dennis Ross all voted for it. I think they're helping, hoping the Senate bails them out. But I don't think the Senate's got a magic wand here. Keith? Well, just as somebody's run for office four times, when you go out uh, on the trail and somebody says, well, the other side did something eight years ago, or, well, the Senate did something later, that does not wipe out the ad that says, this guy voted to take away your health care. So this is a, a very difficult position that President Trump and his leaders ask their members right. to do. Let's, I would say sure. one thing to comment on what you said. It can't do it, cut the cost and ha hold the benefits. I did it. Take uh, the plan I designed. Well, then they should adopt your plan in Washington, but I don't think they're going <laughs> I to. I don't think they're either. It's, it's almost 15 <laughs> years. Yes, it is a supplemental to Medicare, but it was in trouble. You can do that. It depends on how you structure the plan. All right, let's talk about the budget deal, a temporary uh, uh, budget deal uh, through the end of the fiscal year was reached this this Congress but but Frank um, it does not include money for a wall certainly uh, Mexico is not paying for it yet a lot of reasons why why people in our area voted for Donald Trump is because they don't like illegal immigration and he said he was going to build that wall and so far it's the Republican Congress that is not going along with it that's right at this point to get that bill through again uh, they I had to vote what they wanted because basically you can't close down the government. We always get our heads kicked in every time the government closes down. However, it doesn't mean that wall isn't going up in the future. You can't do everything, let's be honest, in 100 days. Even if the president thought he could, he can't. That wall may still be going up. Maybe not right now, but he'll find a way to finance in all probability. Keith, if that wall does not go up, is there a political price for the president to pay? Because the people who love Donald Trump love him in terms of a, a certain passion that we really have not seen in terms of any president in recent history. No, I think that's true. But on the other hand, it's a test of time. Right now, he's holding on to his base very well. Uh, but if it's one failure and one uh, promise broken after another, that will have uh, a, a cost. And remember, he really only won by 300,000 votes in about 15 counties across the United States. So he has no margin to play with as far as re-election. And let me just say one thing. The Democrats really did come out on top of this bill. And, and I don't care if you love Nancy Pelosi or hate her, love her politics or hate, him, hate her politics. She is a stunningly competent legislator and able to clean their clocks like that. And, you know, so I, I don't always agree with her on everything. But holy cow, they just got what they wanted in that bill, and that's pretty amazing. You know, Alan, it's, uh, uh, I think it's too early to say the wall's not in the budget. We haven't checked the Mexican budget yet to see <laughs> if they have some money funded. Because remember, this isn't coming out of our budget. It's supposed to come out of their budget. So we need to really check with the Mexicans and see if they've got a fund. All right, let's talk about the other major news of the week, and that was the testimony of the FBI director before uh, first the, the Senate Intelligence Committee. When he is explaining for the first time in great detail his decision to release that letter several days before the election uh, saying that he was reopening the investigation in, into uh, Hillary Clinton's emails which many Democrats and political scientists like Keith Fitzgerald believe had a, a real impact on the election but do we at this point does that issue uh, still make Democrats uh, angry on a massive level or are Democrats trying to get past that and are more interested in the Russia investigation? Well, uh, personally, I think that this, what this testimony really needs to be about is uh, what our procedures are, how the FBI operates going forward. I'm not of the school that we should say that the director is some kind of terrible person or engaged in a cover-up or he's politically motivated, but he clearly has a double standard, which he had a very difficult time explaining. Uh, of saying, well, I don't comment on these kinds of cases, but there's one that I will comment on. That's an, just an assailable position. He's going to have to figure out it. It takes 
uh, a, a major toll on the credibility of the FBI as an institution. Patrick, again, the pulse of the, the public around here, do they care about that at this stage? Do they care about the Russia investigation and whether or not uh, there was a coordination between the Trump campaign and Russian intelligence? Democrats care about both. Republicans don't. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're a Trump supporter, you don't care about the Russian investigation, and you really don't care about, uh, about what they did with Hillary. If you're a Democrat, you feel like you've been wronged on both sides. You know, you had the FBI director decide all of a sudden that he had to uh, uh, speak out on Hillary, but he cannot, de he won't deny or confirm on, on, on Trump. It makes no sense, and therefore they feel like they've been wrong. For, uh, let, let, let's look at something, basically. Okay, if the Russians interfered, one, they never got into the voting polls. That's and not I, the question, though, Frank. Yeah. The, que the, the question uh, in terms of the Russian interference is yeah. whether the release of all those emails that were embarrassing may have influenced some people not to vote. But that's where I'm going. How many people in this country knew who John Podesta was? Some of them couldn't find a city on a map, no less knowing John Podesta. I don't think she got hurt hardly at all with that. I mean, no, most people didn't know who these people were writing. Well, Hillary, Hillary definitely was hurt by that. It wasn't a question of, do you know who John Podesta was? It's a question that Donald Trump, 180 times during the course of the campaign, made reference to those emails. Uh, obviously, he did that because it was doing some damage. So. All right, let's take a quick break, and when we return, we'll have final thoughts from our guests, plus what some of our viewers are saying about the House vote to repeal and replace Obamacare. Stay with us. Welcome back. Republicans appear to be gaining momentum on Capitol Hill, reaching a budget deal and taking the first major step towards repealing and replacing Obamacare. What, what can we expect to see going forward? Our guests join us right now for final, get, uh, fi final thoughts. They had me for Clem because they want to go back to talking about health care. Uh, Patrick, um, I mean, wh what is the sense of, of the public in our area right now in terms of, uh, you know, the polls show that Obamacare right now is far more uh, popular than the Republican bill here. And it will get more popular the more Republican bill we get. And that's where we are. You know, we, we don't want what we have until we start to lose it. Uh, we know what it is. We know it's false. Uh, we know how to manipulate. We finally have figured it out. And now we get a new plan, and we don't know how to figure that out and how to operate it with it. And it's, it's, so it's going to be scary, and people are going to start to get more upset. All right, I'm going to let you guys close this out. And I know you're, you're going to disagree with this, but the debate Frank, that you are raising is that Obamacare was was created without much expertise in terms of business expertise. Okay, well, what kind of expertise was put into this Republican bill? That I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I have no idea. And if they didn't bring him in, that was a that was a big mistake. But the ones who have designed plans, you can take all you want out of colleges. And I taught in State University of New York. I taught economics. Okay. Uh, you can take all you want out of the colleges, practical experience by putting a plan together, by timing it and getting the programming up and knowing how you have to readjust it again, knowing how you project, because projections in the first year are almost worthless. Keith, that is, this, is, a is this a situation where Republicans and Democrats are never going to agree on the approach to health care? Well, I don't know about that. If you look at the origins of the Obamacare plan, it actually came out of a plan that originated in some Republican think tanks. It was changed along the way, um, but uh, it also came out of a bipartisan plan that passed in the state of Massachusetts. Um, really, it's the political system that's broken. When people can just sort of choose their facts and not have a dis discussion on uh, the basis of facts or evidence, you have a really tough time. I will say this, this bill as passed is not what we're going to end up with. I think that much is clear. All right, well, we end this on such a hopeful note for the future. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. Before we go, we want to share with you what some of our viewers are saying about the vote to repeal and replace Obamacare. As we have been discussing tonight, the House voted by a narrow margin to approve the Republican health care plan. It now goes to the Senate, where there could be major changes. Here is what some of you are saying. Michael Cabral writes, cool, my insurance can be taken away. Wow, I can't get enough of all winning all that time. Hope I don't get a headache. I won't be able to afford aspirin. So I guess this is where, how we're making America great again. You like that, Frank? Mike Barbario writes, great first step. Hopefully when the Senate is done, it gets even better. And Bill Arthur writes, you think it's great and you don't even know what is in the bill. Don't know what it costs or how many will lose coverage, but it's great. You should be a congressman. 
What do you think about the week in Washington? Join us, our conversation, by visiting our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news at 7. And FYI, you can watch past roundtable discussions on demand. They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. Thanks to our guests for being here tonight. Patrick Montega is editor and publisher of La Cassette Newspaper. Keith Fitzgerald is a professor of political science at New College, as well as a former Democratic member of the Florida House. And Frank Patty is the secretary of the Republican Party of Sarasota.